Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is Michelle Benjamin from Lease Cake. We are here to talk about mastering the franchise game. We're talking to a really amazing Supercuts franchisee today. He's going to share his story, all his tips and tricks and best practices for growing your franchise business. And before I pass it over to Taj and Gary, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this in case you really want to listen to it again. You're welcome to. I will send it out to everyone who registered. And if you have any questions at any point, there's two ways you can ask them. You can either use the Q&A function or you can just send us a chat and we'll be keeping an eye on those throughout. So feel free to um, send them over at any time. You don't have to wait till the end, but we will we'll be leaving some time at the end for a Q&A. All righty. And with that, I will pass it over to Tosh. Well, great. Thank you so much, Michelle. Appreciate you kicking us off as you usually do in the in the best way possible. I am very honored to have uh, a, a very influential guest with a great deal of history in the franchise business, um, a board member of the IFA, board member of the Coalition of Franchise Associations. Uh, let's see what else on the Franchise Advisory Council of Supercuts. And here to tell his story is Gary Robbins. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for having me, Taj. Absolutely. I might have missed a little bit of the alphabet soup of all the different associations that you've been a part of, um, and you will definitely get a chance to tell your story. So we're very, very pleased to have you on board. And, uh, you know, you've know, you been a customer for how long now? Uh, quite a while now. It's been a number of years. I, 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 I can't remember exactly. No worries. There's, it's been a blur, as we all know. Well, my name is Taj Adhav. I'm the founder of Lease Cake. And, you know, Lease Cake started with a question. We're very consumer, uh, customer centric. And that feedback helps fuel the continued innovation that uh, our customers get the benefit of. And we think of this as a Lease Cake Live webinar. It's more of an educational content series that we're running. Proud to host this and kind of kick it off from our kitchen. This is our Lease Cake HQ in Winter Park. Florida, just a little north of Orlando, so it's the other side that most people don't think of. So we uh, we welcome everybody, and thank you so much. Uh, one thing that Michelle um, uh, probably wanted to mention as well, this is an interactive session. It's really important not only to share with you, you know, learnings and best practices, but also to respond to your feedback on the fly. So yeah, we'll have time at the end for Q&A, but there is a chat um uh, panel there for you to raise your hand, ask questions, and we'll do our best to answer them uh, right there on the fly for you. So let's keep this interactive and uh, let's start to have some fun. So Gary, you got a great story. How did Thanks. it start? Well, um, as I've been in franchising um, for over 30 years. Um, as you can tell by my picture, I started when I was like five. <laughs> um, so, um, I've uh, I'm all I've always been a uh, believer in a franchising. I've had a number of businesses over the years in retail, uh, in food service, in entertainment, in travel, um, but uh, always had kind of a um, uh, a gravity towards coming back to uh, franchising. Um, I'm a believer in in peers and mentors and and learning from the success and and failures of of other people uh, certainly and and uh, copying their success and and also taking credit for it. <laughs> uh, but well, and that's that's the beauty of franchising, isn't it? I mean, it's here's the concept. You know, it's 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 uh, you know lather, rinse, repeat, right? So yes, so you. Uh, I like to say I know 5,000 things in business, you know, 4,996 or what not to do. <laughs> uh, note to self, don't do that. That doesn't work. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to mention if there are franchisees on the phone, you know, part of the story of franchising uh, is, is a service and giving back to franchising in itself, whether that's serving on the board of the uh, International Franchise Association or the Coalition of Franchise um, associations or on my my um, my brand board, the Supercuts Franchisee Association. I mean, I've 
many, many years ago, I took the path of getting engaged in franchising because I was a believer in it. And I wanted to, and I wanted to pre protect, uh, protect it. Uh, I think it's a great place to start an entrepreneurial career for um, anyone. And um, when you engage yourself in franchising, whether that's in the industry through the uh, industry associations or whether it's uh, in your, your franchise advisory board, you get the opportunity to meet the other leaders, the other, the other uh, thought leaders in franchising. And that has certainly um, helped my business. And, um, you know, lately over the last few years, um, there's been a lot of effort by the organizations to, to help protect franchising because it is, you know, the franchising business model in a various, various ways at the state and local levels is, 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 you know, under attack there, we're getting, we're getting caught in the nets of, uh, um, regulation or, um, uh, rulemaking that is really, uh, uh, in some ways made, you know, to help guide larger companies uh, towards doing the right thing. And, and we're getting caught in those nets when re in reality, we may be part of a large franchise chain, but we're all really small business owners. Right, right. Uh, and, 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 and it wasn't that, it wasn't really so much so way back when, right? I mean, no. let's, let's talk about, you know, what, what was it like, you know, and how you got started in franchising. We'll certainly cover the challenges as well that you that you raised, but uh, why don't you expand on this? Well, I just uh, uh, um, you know want want to urge uh, a part of your part of any franchisee's growth and development in franchising. I urge you to get involved in the franchising community and the franchising industry in itself. It it may not be affecting you on a day to day basis, but the neighborhood's on fire, okay, and and you just can't just protect your house and let and let the neighborhood burn down because sooner or later, um, it's it's going to uh, get to you. I'm with you. Um, so, what was what was that um, that moment that you said, "Hey, let me let me open a franchise"? Like, why did you choose Supercuts, or how did you choose Supercuts? Boy, there, you know, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of criteria that you have to go through uh, in order to select the right brand. Going back in time a little bit, um, one of my other businesses was uh, video stores. I, I don't know if anybody remembers video stores, but I had a few video stores. Can we and, say the, can we say the brand name? Yeah, it was West Coast Video. And, um, uh, I'm reading Time Magazine. Does anybody even remember Time Magazine? I don't know. Uh, and, and video stores were on the cover of Time Magazine. And uh, the, I was reading the article and it said, uh, oh, by the way, uh, next week, um, all the video stores will be gone because of technology. And I'm like, ah, well, that kind of sucks, <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, they lasted a, a while longer, but I knew that it was a dying industry. And I knew that I had to choose uh, uh, a new business to go into. And um, I didn't know what we were going to do. Um, I was I was somewhat agnostic to it. Uh, and But I had a criteria that I was looking for things that I wanted in a business and things I didn't want in the business based off of my prior experience. And, and there's plenty of examples around that. For example, uh, I was in the travel business and had accounts receivable. And uh, I couldn't collect money. I, I'm not a person who can collect money. And and uh, so uh, I said, you know, whatever business I'm going into, don't know what it is, can't be accounts receivable. Don't no accounts receivable. Um, I I um, uh, so I wanted a uh, cash business where whatever it was, whatever service or product we were providing, we were going to get paid for at that time of service. Here I was in a business that was going to get supplanted, uh, the video business, by technology next week, according to time. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to be cautious of what business we were going into that wasn't going to be able to uh, be uh, uh, disappear by uh, or be impacted greatly by technology in a relatively 
uh, short period of time. Now there was a there was a you know a half a dozen other criteria too that I was just kind of applying to it, and I was looking at twenty different businesses. I got to tell you, you know what I remember, and you could tell I need a haircut. I got to go down to the supercuts here in Winter Park. But how many times that I've been on the, in the barber chair, thinking, man, I wonder if I should open up a, a salon, right? Yeah, like like a supercuts because everybody needs a haircut. It's a cash based business. All the things that you mentioned were just totally spot on. It's cash based business, and you know if you have this online booking and just a remindering system. I mean, you're sitting there for, you know, for men, it's about 30 minutes. But yeah, I, I, I can totally relate to the things you were going through. So continue on the screening, yeah. if, you, if you will. Yeah, sure. And look, geography was screening um, yeah. because I actually looked at McDonald's and they're like, yes, you can do McDonald's, but you got to go to Russia. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, I'm not going to go to Russia. <laughs> uh, so, so there were a number of criteria. Another criteria was I wanted a business that I could work on, not in. Um, what does that mean? That, what, what does that mean? Work you know, on versus I, in? I'll go back to some of my other businesses. When someone would, uh, they were much smaller at the time, when they would call out or something would happen, I would go in and I would do the work of the business. I would be standing behind the counter. I would be uh, taking travel reservations or in the when we were in some of the food service business, I would be working behind the scenes there, I would actually be uh, on the front line, working, covering shifts, doing schedules, whatever uh, those things, the work of the business there. And I, I, uh, I had some events that that happened over time that made me realize the power of working on it rather than in it. When I, one of the reasons I chose that was one of my screening criteria. So. So I was looking at 20 different businesses. If you'd asked me to rank them from one to 20, I would have ranked hair salons number 21. <laughs> I had no intention whatsoever of getting into the hair salon business. But as I ran this criteria over and over, and then as you, you narrowed it down, and, and so, you know, I narrowed it down to five and super cuts, no pun intended, had made the cut. And you dig a little bit deeper, you find, you refine your criteria a little bit about what you're looking for. And, um, narrow it down even further. So it was really an objective, um, uh, an analysis. Um, and, you know, ch more of the choice around supercuts, the other franchisees, I was, were, a, had a, had an outsized influence on that. These were, uh, business owners, uh, that were open and sharing and the leadership team, uh, that I met there because, you know, it's, it's it's easier to it's easier to get divorced than it is to get out of your franchise agreement. So um, you you want to make sure that the leadership team um, shares your values and uh, your culture uh, there. Certainly, unit economics is a uh, big consideration when you're searching for a new brand brand. The operational simplicity um, because. You know, I'm I'm really not that smart a guy. I need something very simple and 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 easily repeatable to execute on. So if it's a very complicated business, that would not be something um, for me. And certainly the brand health and the culture; those were all factors that kind of went in yeah. to uh, choosing Supercuts. Well, I think it's fascinating when you said you, you embarked on this journey. Supercuts didn't even make your list of the top twenty. Like it wasn't even on the top 20. 20. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It was number 21. Uh, you know, I mean, th and that's fascinating that now look at how prolific and successful you've, you, you've been because of that rigor, right. Working on the business and not necessarily in it. Uh, yes. That speaks volumes. Cool. Well, I'm going to advance here. So let's talk about the, the, the power because you talked about, you know, if neighborhoods are burning down, you don't want to just protect your house. You talked about speaking with other franchisees, unit level economics. It sounds like the Supercuts ecosystem is very supportive and collaborative. Um, let's talk about the the power and and who's in this power seat. You know, as it relates to franchising. Yeah, look, I know there's some franchise wars on the phone, and um, yeah, I mean, no disrespect, but I believe the real power of franchising is the other franchisees if you choose to engage yourself um, with them. Because 
whatever problem, whatever challenge you may be experiencing, somebody else has already been through it. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I know 5,000 things, 4,995 are what not to do. And um, you, 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 you join a franchise system, you have one unit, your very first one, and now you're in the club with the people who have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. You're in that club. And, and if you can learn from their successes and their failures, I, I've always been a big believer in peers and mentors. And that's why I think franchising is such a great place to start an entrepreneurial career because you automatically get peers and, and, and mentors and you can learn from the wisdom of others. The other real power of franchising is, is I think franchising really does some heavy lifting nowadays. Um, I started out with a vision in mind, uh, not the vision that where we are today, uh, at, at, at the size that we are today, it was a little bit smaller. Today we have a new vision, but um, I had a vision in mind about where we were going, okay? And what I wanted to achieve and how we were going to get there. And franchising takes some things off of your plate. If I were to do this on my own, whether it was in the salon business or any other business, I'd have to worry about designing the store. You know, what kind of flooring are we using? What kind of wallpaper are we using? What does our color scheme look like? Um, uh, I'd have to set up our marketing and our marketing templates. Um, so I think franchising brings a lot of uh, uh, resources to the table that allows you, uh, frees you up to take capital, take your capital, whatever it is, and apply it to growing faster. Yeah. And you well, probably could on your own because you'd be sidetracked by all the other things that you, the heavy lifting, those blocks that you got to put in place in order to be able to grow. Oh yeah. I mean, listen, this is a great country. It's really easy to start a business, but it's really hard to continue to run it and grow it. Um, yeah. we, we've got some, some really great questions that are actually coming across uh, the line here with, um, and so I've got two questions. Um, that list of of you know your your criteria for brand selection, yes. um, if that is that something you can share with me and then we can kind of put it together in a in a post. I think yeah, that'd be sure. Really cool. Sure, and it you know uh, again it evolved over time. Briefly at the time it was you know the technology, the geography. Uh, it had to be franchising, had to be a cash business. I mean, wanted a shot at being the market leader. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, you know, unfair advantage accrues to a market leader. And, and you can be the market leader in your community. You can be the market leader in your region. You can be the market leader in your state. You don't have to be the market leader in the, in, in the country. Well said. I wanted to be a uh, working on it, not in it. I wanted something, uh, you know, suited to my skills. Today, those, that criteria is evolved. I, you know, I want added value, no commodity, no business where price is the only factor OK, because keep competing on price, if you're not doing everything cheaper than your competitors, if you're not buying the cheapest pencils and the cheapest uh, uh, supplies, you're going to have a tough time. Um, you know, demographics and swimming with the tide, the population is, you know, aging a little bit. Uh, I like businesses that are, are human capital businesses and, and you can manage the uh, productivity, uh, of course, peers and mentors. In a simple business, I like businesses that have some some type of barrier to entry. Okay, something to it. In 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 my current business, it's human capital. How you uh, uh, attract, retain, inspire, motivate uh, people, uh, and and the long term economics. I am looking at the long term economics. I don't want something that's going to change. I need to see twenty five years ahead that this business is going to be around. I have many friends in franchising and in the franchising industry who are, who've made that decision. No, I'm going, you know, maybe it's the cell phone business. I don't know what that looks like in five years. I have a tough time seeing it. I have a tough yeah. time seeing the fitness business in five years. It, it keeps, it keeps evolving and changing. It's, it's, it's small uh, fitness places. It's massive fitness places and it gets sliced and dice. I, I have a, a little bit trouble yeah. seeing the future on it. Yeah. No, th that list is that's fantastic. So, you know, what we can do is um, I, I think it, it could be a great blog post or even, you know, best practices, because I was at a uh, at an industry event recently and 
you know, it's highly competitive, right? Franchising is very competitive and franchisers look, are looking for, you know, what's the edge that I can, uh, I can basically speak to in my friend dev side of the organization. So I think, you know, your criteria is, I think it'll be fantastic to help our entire audience. We've got, you know, many different mixes of people and in different industries that are here listening to our Least Cake Live webinar. And uh, we're happy to share that um, after this call over the next week or so. That's that's great. Um, you know, your the other question actually that, that came across because there are multiple different uh, respective groups that are listening. Franchise advisory councils. Here's the question: I'm a franchisor with 100 plus units, uh, thinking about doing creating a franchisee advisory council. How would I go about doing it? And maybe there's it's going to be a longer conversation, but should it be done? Number one, and is it complicated? And what are what are some of the quick few steps? Um, I think there are some organizations out there. Uh, uh, the American Association of Franchise Dealers that can help set up franchise advisory councils. I think uh, getting involved with the IFA because you're going to come across uh, franchisors in the IFA, mostly who have franchise advisory councils, and they're going to share with you right. the good and the bad and the ugly of it. But I, I think they're imperative. And I would not buy a franchise without a franchise advisory council uh, in there. Uh, and for fran franchisors on the phone, your, your, your greatest asset and your greatest liability is not on your balance sheet. It's your relationship with your franchisees. And it can be highly constructive or highly destructive. <laughs> and, yeah. and if you're not having open lines of communication with them, and, and if you're not telling your story, okay, and fr franchisees are more guilty of this than anybody. If you don't tell your story to your franchisees, we make one up. And let me tell you about the one we make up because it's not a good one. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I I wish there was a way to quantify that. You know, as, as a as a former CPA, it's like when you speak balance sheet and capitalizing, you know, the asset of a franchise relationship across the ecosystem, like that, that'd be invaluable. I just don't know how to measure it, right? I mean, there's just surveys and, um, not, you know, not franchise. sitting on the balance sheet, but it's your greatest asset or your greatest liability. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and there's some really good organizations. I think Franchise Business Review does these assessments of, you know, uh, the the top ranked, the the most favorite franchisors. Not that it's contentious, but man, it's it's highly competitive. You need to, you know, make certain you're doing all the, all those right steps. So that's that's great advice. Um, and thank you for sharing that, Gary. On on the growth side, you know, you've grown, right? I mean, when you started, you had one. Right. Now you got 60, right? Correct. What, what are those what are those avenues of growth that, that you've encountered or uh, you would recommend? Well, a couple of things around growth that I want that I'd like to speak to if I may, Tosh. Sure. You know, over the years we've we've targeted growth, okay? Um, and we've targeted growth in three areas. Uh, organic growth, which is build new stores. Um, same store sales, okay, um, uh, increasing our, our current unit performance or acquisition. And each one of those makes up at any given time uh, a, a percentage of our growth. So we were early on, you know, targeting growth rates of, of 20%. I was working on the vision, working on where we were trying to get to for the future. Um, and, and that kind of, if I worked it backwards, I worked, oh, we got to grow at 20% a year. Now, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to get same store sales. We're going to get about 6% from same store sales at the time. Organic growth, building a new store. Oh, we're going to build new, two new stores. That's going to give us, this year, that's going to give us, you know, 12% growth. So that puts us at 18. Uh, you know, we had to make up to, and maybe, maybe we would look at acquisition. And those three levers for us, Organic growth, building new stores, same store sales or acquisitions. Those are levers at any given time. One is much greater than another one. You know, right now in the walk-in non-appointment hair salon business, there's not a lot of organic growth out there. So we're focused on same store sales and we're focused on acquisitions to keep ourselves growing. So that's how we look at growth, okay? 
but it's imperative that we grow. We have to grow. If you were to ask me personally, I don't need any more salons. I'm good. <laughs> Gary's good. <laughs> okay. But we're going to keep growing and we're going to keep growing aggressively, mainly for three reasons. One, you have to keep your competitors at bay. Okay. I was just going to say, yeah. If you're not growing, you're, you're, I don't care what business you're in, whether you're, if you're in a retail based business or whatever, if you're not growing, your, your competitors are, are growing against you and they're, they're going to want to take your, your market share. And more importantly today, they're going to come after your employees. Yeah. Um, so you have to keep your competitors at bay. Um, you know, in my experience, the second reason to keep growing is over time, we've become more efficient as a company because how you're doing things in the company, they break down as you grow larger and larger. For example, when you have maybe five locations or 50 employees, how you do payroll, that is not going to work <laughs> when you have 20 locations and 200 employees. That system, whatever it may be, will uh, break down. You will fix it and it will become more efficient and it will help it'll help your company become more efficient it will that efficiency will flow to your bottom line over time uh, as various systems break down you fix them more efficiently and they they break several times you know you know your payroll system could break three or four times as you get to larger and larger employees um, and the number one reason though beyond all other reasons that you have to keep growing is the best people. The best people want to work, okay, where they have a chance for a bigger future for themselves and their families. They want to work where there's a bus. That's where the best people want to go. And you need to create that opportunity and that security uh, for the best people. If I went yeah. to my people and I said, guys, Gary's good, okay? You know, we got 60 songs. We're just not going to grow anymore. All my best people would scratch their heads and go, well, what about my future? I wanted, you know, I was hooked on to this for a greater future for myself and my family. They would question it. And all my mediocre people would cheer. Oh, my God, the pressure's off. We're good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, and so it's you have to keep growing to keep your great people and create an opportunity for a bigger future for them, because that's where the great people want to work. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we know the labor market is so tight and it's so competitive and uh, it's so hard to entice, you know, great workers to join you. So 100% agree. Uh, competition exists everywhere. And labor is, I think the, the, one of the biggest things that preoccupy people's minds, but on the competition side as it relates to a location, um, I share a couple of stories, but I wanted to get your opinion about this. I mean, obviously renewal options are really important, right? You don't want to miss a notice to a landlord that you want to renew for that location. Um, but there are other really smart operators that if they know that strip center, they know that mall, they know who to talk to, they'll ask the landlord, hey, is that tenant in that specific space, another competing salon owner, are they in default of any one of the provisions in the in the lease? You know, is there any way to kind of kick them out? And you got to believe that that landlord ab absolutely wants to get a, a, a tenant in there that can pay a higher rent. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just renewals. It's, it's things of, uh, you know, other kind of mission critical dates that most people don't pay attention to. But a landlord who's prompted by a competitor could certainly create massive problems. I mean, what, what's your thought on that? Well, I have a couple thoughts on, <laughs> on that. And some I think will be mentioned later, later about and maybe bears repeating. Yeah. I think one thing that new franchisees, one mistake that they do is they're not familiar with they don't learn the real estate market in their market. They don't get relationships or build relationships with the landlords and the brokers in the market. 
they sort of leave it to the franchisor. And I think that's a huge mistake. Never. Real estate is far too important to leave to someone else in those relationships with the brokers and the landlords. You do got to get in the car and do the broker broker tour and have lunch with them and 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 know your landlords and have a, a dialogue and communication with them on a regular basis. I think much a third, if not half of our real estate today is because of landlord and broker relationships that we've yep. cultivated over years. I did not leave that to someone else. That that came to me. So when that landlord built that new shopping center with the Target and the grocery store, okay? And every single one of my competitors called to be in that shopping center. We were the ones because we, we weren't just a lease over in the Zavala shopping center. We had a relationship um, with them. I, yep. I, Fascinating, I right? Uh, it's like relationships matter. Like you talked about do. relationships with your franchisees matter. They should be on your balance sheet as the number one asset. Relationships, your landlords and brokers matter. Maybe they should be somewhere if they belong, certainly as a, as a, as a strategic asset. Cause this ties to a question from one of our listeners today. Uh, it's, you know, I'm a two unit operator of a salon very much, you know, in your space and they're thinking about a third location, but they're a little gun shy. So would your, would your advice be make sure, you know, the market, make sure, you know, your brokers. What would your advice be for this uh, this uh, attendee? My advice would be that you look you you would know that market better than anybody's. I've taken shopping centers that um, um, I because of my intimate knowledge um, of the market, uh, I knew uh, uh, that this is where we wanted to be. Don't get me wrong. I've made mistakes. I've gone out to a shopping center. I'm standing in the parking lot. I call my wife on the phone and I say, honey, go ahead and redo the kitchen because this site is going to be unbelievable. And then for whatever reasons, it never met expectations. I've also stood in the middle of a cornfield and look around and see nothing and say, okay, well, this is going to be great 10 years from now, but you know, we'll, we're, we're, you know, we got to bank some growth for the future. And we, day one, it's through, it, it exceeds all expectations. So there, so that has happened on, on both sides of the equation for me, you know, the salon business to answer your question, uh, you know, more specifically having an intimate knowledge of the shopping center, but the salon business just has a, you know, in the salon business, I think the saying in real estate, which well knows location, location, location. I think in the salon business, it's uh, manager, manager, manager. The managers have an outsized impact on the success or failure of the salon. We we have salons that uh, are sometimes, uh, you know, in the uh, maybe in the crotch of a shopping center. That's a technical real estate term, the crotch. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we put a great staff and a great manager in there and, and, and we build a business. Yep. Um, you, you can have a um, <clears throat> site that is, or a location that is certified by the ICSC, the International Council of Shopping Centers. They say, this is the number one site in America, <laughs> right here. And, um, and you put a lousy staff and a lousy manager in there and you'll fail. Yep. Uh, it's unique to... I don't want to say that's unique to the salon business, but it's it has an outsized impact on the salon business. Yeah. So so one one area, co-tenancy. I mean, if you were to say, hey, honey, you know, let's remodel the kitchen. This thing is going to be making money. And it could be driven by the fact that there was a great anchor tenant or a co-tenant there. So making sure that you understand what your rights are when that tenant moves out, right? It's suddenly yeah. you just don't have the traffic. So, so those kinds of insights, I mean, are not something that, you know, you go to college and you, and you learn or you learn in high school, oh. like it's just, it's buried in mm -hmm. a very much a, a legal document. You got to understand the terminology and, and what are the get out provisions? I have not gotten by 
choosing location is art and science. You got to, the science has to line up. Okay. The demographics, the population, the traffic counts, um, that you got to look at the science, but all, there's also the art of it. Um, I, like when my kids were a little bit younger, we would go to a potential site and we'd go into the supermarket and we'd walk the aisles up and down. And I would ask my kids, is that our customer? Do you think that's our customer? Is that our customer? Is that our customer? And get them to get a feel for it. Uh, nothing replaces um, driving the neighborhoods and yeah. uh, going to the other businesses and seeing if that's your, your customer there. Yeah. That's the art of it. Um, and, and, and the combination of the two, the art and the science, I, I haven't gotten around the science for some reason, you know, it's, it's, it's a data point. It's not an end all be all to a location. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you know, related to this, and we could probably spend hours having a conversation about, you know, the survival and how, how did you weather the storm of COVID, um, you know, a quick little sound bite on, you know, any recommendations, you know, how, how, how do you get over the angst of, of adding a location given the challenges of the last, you know, two, three years? Um, I, I, I go back to only how I did, and, and we always had a vision for the future. In fact, COVID was a very difficult time for us, uh, especially the salon business, because we were targeting growth. We were targeting growth for this year, next year, the following year. So we were we were we were ahead of our growth curve. We were planning for it. So COVID comes, everything gets shut down, and I'm committed to leases. I have to open up stores during COVID. Um, so very challenging time uh, uh, for us to get through that. But going back to COVID, I, I think much of it. Um, I, I think we did very well in our lease negotiations with amendments and and abatements and deferrals i think we did very well on it because i had landlord relationships yeah uh, so good, much of it came nice. back down to calling them up and and talking to them to gary we're not worried about you okay yeah. yeah we'll throw three months on the end of the lease yeah we'll abate we'll defer for you it wasn't it don't get me wrong <laughs> We had our battles yeah. uh, with landlords. There was no make no mistake, but we also, I think, had a lot of success because we we did have relationships. We weren't some nameless, faceless corporation with a sign sure. over the door. Yeah, makes sense. So you you talk a lot about process and uh, and systems. Um, let's let's touch on that. Right the you know, efficiency of systems. Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, prior the three avenues to growth uh, beyond targeting growth was um, <clears throat> keeping our competitors at bay. Uh, systems break as you grow and you fix them and they become more efficient. And then lastly, uh, uh, creating opportunity for the future for your best people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think lease management is a perfect example. When I look back on my, on those first few leases, yeah, all I did was put like the lease end date in my Outlook calendar or whatever calendar I was at the time. Or, uh, um, and you, know, you can only do that so long. That breaks down. Um, you, you can't have 30 leases in your Outlook calendar. Okay, so then at some point, you know, you're, you move, you have 10, look, you put it on a spreadsheet. Okay. And even then it's not, uh, then, then as you continue to grow, then your, um, uh, you grow beyond being able to manage your real estate on a spreadsheet. Uh, it, it breaks down, you miss a date and got, and you were talking about, you know, uh, uh, earlier, uh, Taj, you mm -hmm. had mentioned that, you know, people who are actively engaged in their markets will call a landlord and go, hey, what's happening in the shopping center? You got any tenants that are coming up to lease expiration or anything like that? Because I really want to be in the shopping center. Boy, today you miss a lease date for a renewal or something like that. The, the demand for space 
surprisingly, you all thought it was going to go down in COVID, but it's greater than ever. And you miss a date and uh, on a on a renewal um, or a, a uh, option term in a lease. And there's a very good chance that that landlord can release that space at a much higher rent than what you're paying right now. Um, so uh, uh, you're, you can't leave that to a spreadsheet anymore. You're risking it. Uh, today, so, so that we went through that process. I was you know, managing it on a, you know, an at least end date on an out, Outlook calendar. Then we moved to a spreadsheet. Today we have to, that system broke down for a lot of reasons, because there's a lot of things that happen in in real estate management. There was insurance certs, there's HVAC contracts, there's any number of things. Well, well, I was managing that off the spreadsheet. Today, at the size of our organization, we have you know many people who are accessing our lease cake database uh, for uh, uh, in in. Uh, insurance certifications for licensing for our maintenance people uh, for the HVAC contracts. It's simply not possible for us to do it without a system. So we've become more efficient. It's not just me accessing the database. It's the administration people. It's the maintenance people. It's um, our compliance. For whatever reason, we need to have uh, a, a uh, strong systems in place to manage our real estate uh, not just for lease dates, but for many other things. Right, uh, right. So that's that's where you have helped us uh, tremendously in that area. And well, honestly, I'm not making a commercial for you, okay? And I and I know there's some small, you know, the, if there's the one, two, three, four franchisee, I wish I'd started earlier because uh, on on lease on um, on uh, lease management database software. It will help you and it has helped us and it w can make you more efficient, relieve some burden, relieve some stress. You, yeah. as the leader of your company, you will be able to delegate things that you're that you're doing, that you're doing right now to someone else uh, because they'll have access to the information. They'll, there'll be a common area where everyone can go. It won't be in a lease file in your house like it was yeah. in my, uh, uh, for me for so long, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that hits on, you know, the power of what what does efficiency mean? And I'd, I'd love to get your feedback on the, the things that you you touched on, right? Delegation. Lots of people need access to information. Um, getting getting you know, int introducing speed in the organization. So there are some stats and I'd love to get your feedback on this. Um, studies by universities and, and thought leadership groups about what knowledge workers spend time on. And mm -hmm. it's been found that 20% of an average knowledge worker or worker in the back office spends time looking for or recreating information that already exists. Is that what you mean by efficiency, speed, oh. access? Not only access, but speed to, I mean, it just happened yesterday. We had a landlord, you know, uh, uh, trying to collect, said we had a pass due from COVID, <laughs> pass due rent. I know we did the amendment and um, we we went, I know it seems like a commercial free, but we, but we went right into the lease management software, pulled up the minutes, said over, to done, problem solved in, in under two minutes. Whereas uh, in a lease file, hunting the thing that, that before that would have taken two hours for us. And yeah. uh, uh, somebody in the office, okay, I'd have to shoot an email to someone in the office. It's going to have to go to the lease file, scan the lease, get it over, send me the email, uh, you know, find the amendment. Yes, uh, just in the last couple of days, it was, you know, a, a three hour problem solved in three minutes. Wow, that's that, that's uh, enlightening and it's humbling. <laughs> Just there's there's something about getting customer feedback, and then they say, "I do want to track my permits. I do want to track my licenses, and I want to track my franchise agreements." Um, you know, who are we to say this is all you can track with LeaseGate? But there's 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 so many other things that really matter, right? Helping you focus on what matters when it matters. So, um, 
we can talk for a long time about so many different topics, Gary, uh, but you touched on locations and whether it's a cornfield or whether it's a really high volume strip center. Uh, are you finding that restaurant, I mean, um, you know, the retail space for salons is is scarce? I mean, I've heard some horror stories. Yeah, retail t- retail is very tight. Um, at least in our markets, which is, you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, southeastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland, and Delaware. Um, there's been no, you know, development is scarce. I mean, what, uh, 15, 10 years ago, it was all the big supermarket, Target, Walmart, anchored centers that were being built. And there's not a lot of those being built anymore. A lot of it's maybe strip retail or fill-in retail or multi-use office uh, uh, retail in there. And it's, and with COVID, the expense of this, uh, of, of development has really uh, skyrocketed. So we are, um, I think landlord relationships have also, you know, helped us on, um, uh, you know, being able to negotiate a little bit better uh, deal when we have a, you know, a landlord that we have three or four sites. We we pride ourselves on being quiet tenants. We're just quiet. It, it, you know, if the roof leaks, we yeah, we call them, but we just replace the ceiling tiles ourselves. We're not getting in any battles with them about, you didn't remove the snow. We just removed the snow ourselves in front of the space. We fixed the ceiling tile. We, 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 we try not, to, we try to be very quiet. And we also, uh, try not to be on their AR list. And that's, you, you know, when we go yeah. to new land, landlords uh, and you say, look, our goal is not to be on your AR and to be a very quiet tenant. Uh, yeah. And they appreciate that. Um, so so finding new locations, nothing trumps the landlord relationships or even the broker um, relationships. I tend to like to choose our broker. You know, there's there's art and science and choosing the broker. I, I I like to maybe choose the number one broker. We operate in a bunch of different markets. So we have a few different brokers. Okay. But I, 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 I lean towards the number one broker in the market because, um, and, and because we're only, you know, 1500 square feet, uh, give or take, we are a smaller footprint tenant. Um, I tend to be with um, one of the, Junior is not the right word, but one of the frontline brokers. But I have relationships with with the partners or the brokers there because when I need them, when they're building the new target center, that's not going through the new through through the frontline broker. That's going through the partnership brokers, and we need to bring their influence and and their resources to make sure we're the hair salon that's in that salon. So, but but by the same token, when you you're picking that frontline broker. He's out there knocking on doors. He's making phone calls. Yeah. He's doing it. So a combination of the two uh, is what I like. And I kind of find that in the number one brokerage. Yeah. You know, and it's easy to tell. You just drive around uh, for the most part. And you see who represents most of the shopping center. You do have to be a little bit careful sometimes, though, because you, and you can do it with relationships because when the broker is representing the landlord and you at the same time, you you want to make sure that both interests are being served appropriately. And and so to touch on uh, some of the provisions that um, that have been raised to our attention, you want to make sure that the right language is in the lease, like making sure that the landlord has the responsibility to have appropriate snow removal. That was our aha moment when we had customers saying, hey, can you guys track snow removal contracts and make sure that in April, I'm I'm certain that the landlord has secured the snow removal guy for the parking lot. I'm like, yeah. that that was our aha moment. So, you know, what what was yours? You know, like when you started the company, um, you know, what what triggered to help you scale and have this growth mindset? Wow, my gosh, there's been so many aha moments, but to speak, <laughs> I can tell you to this day, you know, when we're negotiating letters of intent or uh, leases, we there's about five or six things that we need 
we know from experience that we need to get into the lease that are nuanced and we can just pull up the lease really quick in lease cake, cut, you know, copy, paste into our document, done. We don't have to go look it up and lease retype it. So that's another point. And that, I guess that one falls on me a little bit. So I'm um, quite aware of it. Um, you know, aha moments. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I guess if I were to speak generally, sure. I, I, I would speak um, uh, at some point in the company. Uh, I was, you know, managing it uh, uh, from day to day. And um, unfortunately, I had an event in my life. My mother became very ill. I had to step away from the business for over a year. And um, but I kept my finger on the pulse of the business. And as I was away from the business for a year, the business grew, kept getting better and better and better and better and better. And I'm like, OK, uh, unfortunately, my mother passed. I came back to the business and then the business started going down, 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 down. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? OK, uh, with Gary, without Gary, it's getting better. With Gary, it's getting worse. And um, my my aha moment was the difference between leadership and management when I had um, started the company, one store, there was the org chart. And uh, you can picture that org chart in your mind. It was Gary president and reporting to Gary was the director of real estate, who was Gary, and the finance director, who was Gary reports to Gary, 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 Gary reports to Gary. So over the years, I had put people in those positions, but I never left the box with them. I was managing them. I was in their box and they wanted to make Gary happy. So I'd go and go, what's going on with this? What about this? What about this? And they're bouncing yeah. all around in their box. They don't know which direction to go because I haven't left the box. I'm still in there with them. And when I had to step away, I actually had to step out of their boxes. And what they happened to do is they all lined to the top box, which is Gary, the leader of the company. And, and then so everybody's rowing in the same direction at the same cadence. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> Uh, that really, cool. that was a point that accelerated our growth. There were yeah. other points, there were aha moments, but uh, I'm not saying I'm a great leader, but the skills of leadership and management are different. The skills of management are perishable. If you don't use them, you lose them. Um, I, I am not allowed to talk to people uh, in the company unsupervised anymore because generally after they speak to me, uh, they, they tend to quit. Uh, and, uh, but so, uh, so that's management, but, uh, so my role is, uh, uh, as a leader is, uh, always working on my leadership skills. Leadership is very intangible. Um, you, you're not, when you're a manager, you're, you got a lot of satisfaction. You're managing, you, you're, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this today. Look at you. The whole world revolves around you. Look at all you achieved today with leadership. It's more intangible. Yeah, I spun around in my chair today. I talked to some people about where we're going and how we're going to get there and what their role is in it. And you don't you don't get that same satisfaction. Yeah. Uh, but but that really helped me find purpose in our company, which um, which brought us to where we are today. Wonderful. I, so I'll I'll we I moved to a leadership strategy of developing our people and trying to make them successful, uh, focusing uh, beyond my own self-interest on their growth and development. And that turned us into a kind of a development company today. So that's nice. So it's, it's, it's empowerment. It's the growth mindset. I, I love the fact that, you know, there's a massive distinction as we all know, but you have to be reminded of the differences between leadership and management. Um, so we wanted to save some time for some Q and a, we do have some, some really great questions coming in, but, uh, and perhaps some of them are going to be answered through this, uh, you know, this section here as we get close to wrapping up and appreciate everybody's, everybody's feedback and, and the questions that are coming in. So advice, you know, how did you start as, uh, as, fran as franchisees? Yeah, as franchisees, you know, advice for other there, potential franchisees. There's, there's a secret. Um, there's a start. secret. There's a secret to franchising um, with your franchisor, and that secret is to get your franchisor to do things for you because they want to, not because they have to. They got that whole list of franchisees. What are you doing for me? You didn't do this, and you did this. Look, I honestly, I think royalties 
are about right, you know, six, seven percent, because they're responsible for about six or seven percent of my success. OK, unless I fail, of course, if I fail, it's all their fault. OK, <laughs> um, I want to be clear on that. And uh, but but you don't want to be that franchisee. Um, you yeah. want to be the fran you want to develop your uh, constructive relationships with your franchise partners so that they do things for you because they want to, um, not because they have to. Um, I see. My other advice is to engage and learn with other franchisees. Share everything you know. I don't even share it with your competitors who are other franchisees who you've developed relationships because it's all about the execution. You know, I'll give you all of my ideas, okay, and all the great things we're doing. Let me see you execute them because by the time you're around executing them, I'm on to the next idea. Yeah. Well, we've got about five minutes left, a little bit less yeah. than that. Um, we'll move to just general Q&A, making sure that we have a chance to respond back. So um, here's here's a question. Should I, as I start my franchising journey and I've got seven locations, should, should I be thinking about an exit plan? Yes. Um, so yes and no, it depends. Uh, Look, I, I think not thinking, I don't know if it's so much about the details of an exit plan. Um, I think it's about a vision for your life as a whole. I know that's a big philosophical statement here, but what are you trying to achieve um, in general? And, and, and does exiting the business get you closer to that, okay? Or growing the business? Look, I, I think, um, what if you sell you gotta there's two reasons to sell your business there's um um economic reasons or lifestyle re or life reasons there's no economic reason to sell my business okay the, the, there's because i couldn't take that that pile of money and deploy that capital at the same rates of return, it would be like in baseball, I had a 400 hitter and I traded him for a 200 hitter, okay? So the economic reasons to sell the business don't line up. Are there lifestyle reasons to sell the business? You're sure. at that point in your life or whatever. So I, that's how I look at it. An economic reason yep. or a lifestyle reason. Sell Makes sense. Makes sense. A um, couple, uh, couple more minutes Quick question, what's the most important person you would recommend hiring as you grow? Title. Um, so you're you're hiring that first person, you're in or your four or five, six franchisees you're doing on your own. Uh, the first person is a financial accounting uh, metrics person. Get your arm, that's the first person. Absolutely, in that administrative staff that is going to pull all your, your finance information that's going to get your metrics and your KPIs to you on whatever rate rhythm you need daily, weekly, monthly, get your unit economic reports to you on whatever rhythm. I feel strongly about this. That's the first part. You need to have a strong, um, uh, uh, strong sense of what's yeah. going on on every unit economically and, and, and the KPIs. And, and that's the first person that Absolutely. I would go with. Okay. Well then here's a quick follow-up and, and I can respond to this, you know, um, is that person a CPA? And I would say they ideally should be, but if you're in franchising, make sure they have franchise expertise. Um, and if you'd, if you'd like to reach out to me, I know you uh, asked that question anonymously, but uh, you know, we're happy to help, you know, give you some ideas. Um, but certainly someone that's expert in unit level economics that understands scale and growth and systems is, is ideal. And so um, you need somebody who can look, I got this idea. Like what, wait, our, you know, our, what's our, what's our guest count? Uh, uh, what's our frequency? How frequency do we, and then you need somebody who gets, goes, get you that answer to that question, can mine your data, has access to that. And that's, so it's not only just financial accounting, it yeah. is uh, the metric accounting that that person is Numbers. responsible. Before. numbers oriented absolutely yeah. numbers well oriented. um gary it's been an absolute pleasure and obviously <laughs> we could talk about 
so many really meaty topics and it will probably uh, uh, start to spin off some other uh, focused areas, if you will. But, you know, as I said at the outset of this Least Cake Live webinar is we're very customer centric. Um, we love to hear the challenges that operators like you face, franchisors or franchisees. And is there anything you would recommend or things that we at Least Cake can improve upon, whether it's the product, uh, customer success, onboarding? Give me your thoughts, just candidly. The leadership needs to be replaced. I'm just kidding, Tosh. Um, I'm, I'm going to get some uh, beer out of that fridge. <laughs> yeah, look, I've been with Least Cake for a while. I've seen you growing. I've seen you. I've seen the additional things that you're adding. Stay on that path. You're either on the path of evolution or the path of de-evolution. You've added, you know, we're administrating our, our cosmetology license. We're administrating our, our uh, HVAC ma maintenance. You've added all those things over the year. We're administrating assets, our permits, um, things in there. You're adding things that are helping us to uh, uh, manage all the administrative things that kind of this bubble around the stores and also what's in them. So I just want you to keep doing, keep doing that. I, you know, there's, there's um, lots of room at the top of the mountain, but if you stop, you know, uh, evolving and growing, I just want you to stay on that path because I've seen the that. product evolve yeah. um, over uh, a number of years. And I, so if you ask me, Hey, Gary, what do you want us to, what do you want us to do? I'll come up with a whole list of things for you to do, but yes, and that'll be, a, that'll be a hundred things long. But I just want you to keep it on the path that you've been on, which is evolving and making it better and and helping us uh, be helping my administrative maintenance and real estate teams access uh, data, store data at their fingertips uh, for us. Keep keep wonderful. Keep doing that. <laughs> I love it. Well, we have our customer advisory and knowledge expert council, uh, which is called our K council. So we'd love to bring you on board. Um, I love the feedback, but this is certainly helping us continue to innovate. Again, thank you so much, Gary. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Again, the recording will be shared uh, as a follow-up uh, to all the attendees. And we thank you for your questions. Uh, looking forward to our next webinar, which is with Chen Cohen, all about franchise law and the changes and the challenges of 2024. But you guys take uh, care and have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Thanks a lot.